Church, today we're going to cover the theme of what it means to be not ashamed or unashamed of our Lord Jesus Christ, specifically in three areas, unashamed of the gospel, His gospel, His people, and His word. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the text. Chapter 1, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. You know, the idea of what it means to be ashamed is carries this idea of someone who has misplaced uh, his trust or her trust in someone or something. As a result of this misplaced trust, this person feels ashamed, betrayed, disgraced, dishonored. Unlike the way that theologians phrase it, as good as someone's face has been disfigured, so ugly that you must cover it. You must shrink away from people, shrink in size, so ashamed that you cover height. And it's from this posture of understanding what a shame is about, the apostle will say, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord Jesus. For that matter, join me in the suffering for the gospel. Join me in being unashamed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, when I look at the apostle Paul's life, I, I can't help but to um, think of multiple reasons and occasions through his missionary life, through his ministry life, through his life as a whole, to be ashamed of the gospel. The moment he received Christ in Damas at the location of Damascus, he was being hunted by his own countrymen, chased out, and more importantly, he had to snuck out of the city of Damascus on a small little basket, like an illegal immigrant. How shameful to run away or just hiding in this small little basket. In Lystra, he was dragged out of the city and stoned to death. For some strange reason, miraculous reason, he was still alive. In Philippi, he was stripped naked, flogged, beaten, chains on his wrists and his ankles and thrown to jail. In Thessalonica, he was chased out of the city, running for his life. In Athens, the Greek leaders were just laughing and mocking at him. What kind of person believes in a crucified person, individual? Which God gets crucified for the matter? His own countrymen in Jerusalem seize him, drag him out, and according to scriptures, ready to just tear him into pieces. His entire life, ministry, missionary life, I think there are reasons, good reasons to be ashamed of the gospel from the Apostle Paul's perspective. Yet despite of these experiences, negative experiences, the Apostle Paul says there are reasons to be unashamed of the gospel. And the first reason he gives is because he has saved us, of which he's further described what it means to be saved. He said, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace, revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Church, essentially what is described here is the attributes, the characteristics of the gospel message of our Lord and Saviour. And you know, if you read scripture, this is not new. This is found all over the New Testament text. And one of the common texts that we often use to describe what salvation entails is 2 Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. We often use it when we disciple newer believers. It says from 2 Timothy itself, huh, we are saved not because of anything we've done. In Ephesians it says, not from ourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so no one can boast. We are saved because of His grace, of which we are saved by grace through faith. And again, we are saved not because of our works, our purpose, but His purpose, of which He has ordained for us to do the good work which He has prepared in advance for all of us to do. On top of that, He has destroyed death nullify the effects of sin of which we are saved from, of which the wages of sin is death, spiritual death, in which He returned it, He changed it and gave us life, abandoned life as described in John 10 verse 10. And lastly, eternal life, immortality, where one day we'll rise again with Him and spend eternity with God. So what you see here is actually the characteristics, the attributes of what entails of the salvation message of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, when I looked at this, I'm reminded of Martin Luther's salvation journey, of his call to salvation. You know, Martin Luther is the great reformer of which he helped shape the church in the 1500s and gave birth to the Protestant church of which we are part of today. Taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. Church, you can read all you want. You can listen to testimonies all day long, but have you experienced the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news message, the gospel of our, of our Lord? 
it is truly liberating and transformative. It is the best decision you ever make and the most important decision you will ever make. So if you have yet to receive Christ, to accept Him as your Lord and Savior, would you seriously consider it today? At the end of the service, step forward. The people in front will love to journey with you and help you through this important decision of which upon receiving Him, your life will no longer be the same. You know, most of us here perhaps have received Jesus in our life. Do we take the next step then to unashamedly profess of it? You know, Martin Luther makes this clear. The moment he received Christ, went through this salvation experience, he went back from Rome to Germany and he unashamedly professed salvation that is not by works, but truly by grace through faith. That got him in trouble, exiled, excommunicated, hunted and persecuted, but yet he remained steadfast, unashamedly professing the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Church, will you do that? If you have tasted God's goodness, will you profess of it? Will you profess of it through words, through deeds, and more importantly, through the entirety of your life? Who will you unashamedly profess the good news to today in this season of your life? You know, the Apostle Paul gave a second reason why we should be unashamed of the gospel. And he says here, because he called us to a holy life. Not only does he save us, has saved us, but called us to a holy life. You know, the concept of being holy or the call to being holy is not new. Old Testament, New Testament is repeatedly found. I like the way how First Thessalonians put it very clearly. God's will, God's destiny, God's purpose for each of us is to be holy. It is, uh, to be honest, a rather abstract Old Testament concept. But I think the easiest way to appreciate what it means to live a holy life is essentially let the gospel renew us, transform us, conform us to be more and more like Christ, like Him, possessing all the attributes of uh, perhaps the good news. Okay, good news. Allowing one to, to perhaps have all the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, graciousness, all of it in one person. You know, when I was preparing for this text, I was trying to imagine someone who is truly conformed, renewed, transformed to be like Christ, possessing all of these fruit of the Spirit characteristics, like love, joy, peace, kindness. When I imagine such a person, to be honest, I told myself, if I was single, not married, and the person is a girl, I would have dated her, married her, chased her to no end. This is such an attractive and irresistible individual. You know what C.E.S. Lewis has to say? How later people know who thinks that holiness is down. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible, truly attractive. One who is conformed, renewed and transformed like Christ, he is truly attractive. And as such, no need to be ashamed. People want to meet you. People want to be drawn close to you. Are you living an attractive and irresistible life? Truly one who is conformed, renewed, and, 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 and um, transformed to be like Christ? In, so, in short, what I'm asking is, are you living a holy life? Or perhaps, are you living an unholy life? Will people look at you like, e, are you sure you're a Christian? Christian can say this, can do this, man? You know, if God were to look into all areas of our life, will He find it to be holy or unholy? Is there pockets, areas in your life that is unholy, that He's asking you to surrender, allowing Him to transform, renew, have it, turn it, so that you can leave the call to be holy? Church, is it your private thoughts? Is it when you scroll through social media and when you are by yourself? Is in this moment, are you living a holy life? Even in this moment, will you live a holy life? You know, we are called to be unashamed of Jesus Christ, specifically His gospel. And now He tells us to be unashamed of His people. What's interesting about text is just in the first verse of our text today, we're covering um, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Interestingly enough, this doesn't end here. The author includes himself into the passage, or of me, his prisoner. What a strange and bizarre uh, approach to ministry, right? Or the text and encouragement itself. Why would someone include himself? It should be God-focused, Christ-centric. It just to be the top two lines. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Full stop. Why did he include himself into the picture? 
It's, I think it's worth noting that the Apostle Paul at this stage of ministry, he is not the super Apostle Paul, going from city to city, preaching, holding gospel rally, performing miracles, planting churches. At this stage of his life, he is in shackles. He's in prison, in this prison called Melantine Prison, thrown in a lower cell, and the only way to access it is through the small little hole. When you go down, the only time you go up is to face your judgment, to face execution. In short, this is a short-term holding cell. If you are placed here, you're just waiting for your day to come, to die. It's upon this place that Paul was in prison that everyone upon hearing it ran far away, deserted him, had no association with him, all except the household of Omicephus. He searched him out, refreshed the Apostle Paul and was not ashamed of his chain. So the question begs again, what is going on? Why did the Apostle Paul include himself in this instruction? It just be, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Full stop. Why include himself? You know, the Scottish uh, theologian Sinclair Ferguson, my favourite Scottish philosopher for this sermon text, made an interesting observation. He said that the structure of these words and thought can be similarly found in another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. And he reads, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Interestingly, I thought that would be the end. But no, he includes himself or a group of people back into the passage and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. Something's amiss, right? It should be God-focused, focus, Christ-focused, and just preach not of ourselves and Jesus as Lord. Full stop. But why did he include back himself or a group of people for himself, ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake? In short, he pointed out the test, the proof of us not preaching ourselves and preaching Christ as Lord is to preach ourselves as servants, your servants, for Christ's sake. Hence, this is our test, our proof of us not preaching ourselves but for Jesus Christ as Lord. And we do so by preaching ourselves as your servant. This similar idea can be found in our text. The proof, the test of us not being ashamed of the testimony of our Lord is when we unashamedly feed, cloak, care, visit, do all these things to the least of these. After all, Matthew 25 makes it clear. When Jesus says, when you do this to them, you do it to me. The test, the proof of us being unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ is when we unashamedly feed, cloak, care, visit, and do all this to the least of this. May we pass this test. Our test, our proof of us being unashamed of the gospel is when we become unashamed of the least of this, of the naked, of the sick, of the prisoners. Will you pass the test? Church, are there the least of this in your life today? Is there someone in your life, in your sphere of influence, who got in trouble with the law, perhaps? Will you journey unashamedly, love and care and journey with this individual? Is there someone who is sick, diagnosed with cancer, terminal illness, no longer able to fend or care for oneself? Will you unashamedly love and care for him or her? Or perhaps someone is struggling to meet, make ends meet. Will you practically, unashamedly care and meet their needs for the test of us being unashamed of our Lord and Saviour uh, the gospel of our Jesus, Jesus Christ is to be unashamed in loving and caring for every one of these will we be unashamed of his people and lastly will we be unashamed of his word scripture tells us uh, the apostle tells Timothy what you heard from me teaching, scripture, the gospel, you are to keep, you are to hold, you are to have it, hold fast to all of them as a pattern of sound teaching in your preaching, in your ministry life, in church life, in all of life itself, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And as if this instruction wasn't clear enough, the Apostle Paul repeats himself through a different analogy, now using the shepherd analogy, guard, watch over, now here describes as the good deposit, something that is so valuable that has been entrusted to you, then you have to guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us all. You know, this instruction is extremely helpful in fending off false teachings, of which we will see in chapter 2 of our sermon series. But you know, the placement of this instruction 
so strange and so uniquely placed in a time of church history of which they were just months, weeks, days, moments away from open persecution. It is interesting enough, the early church in its teachings and instructions and its value system did not believe that, the pers- that persecution would destroy anyone. They weren't too concerned about it. But what concerned them was that false teachings will destroy everyone. Hence, the instructions to grip, to hold fast to the Word of God. To be honest, in times of crisis, in times of difficulties, our grabs on Scripture loosens. We no longer hold as tightly, likely because of the pain, the crisis that we're in. But it's in this moment where our grips get looser. False teaching comes in. Not only does it ruin us, but according to Sinclair Ferguson, it destroys us. As in times of crisis, we need to hold tight the Word of God. Keep God. Hold fast. For in those times, not only do we repel false teachings, but it will anchor us in who we are in Christ and Christ in us. And in that moment, we will not just find strength and power but more importantly, last and survive and even thrive through the times of difficulty such as persecution. You know, in 2017, I was based in the Middle East and as ministry was building up to Holy Week, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, two ISIS terrorists marching to the two of the Coptic churches in Egypt and detonated themselves, taking along them side 43 believers, injuring close to about 800 People. The nation was in outrage, immediately went into lockdown, state of emergency. Everyone was grieving and just shocked by this act of terror. And everyone was still processing what was happening. The Coptic pastor, Bios George, stood before his church and gave a three point sermon addressing the terrorists. This sermon, his sermon, went viral. The title of his message was A Message to Those Who Kill Us. And his first point, We thank you. Because the terrorists gave the dead the honour to die as Christ died. Because the terrorists shortened the victim's journey to their heavenly home. Because the terrorists allowed Christians to fulfil Christ's words as he quoted Luke 10 verse 3, Behold, I send you out as lamb among the wolf. Point number two, We love you. Because even murderers and thieves love those who love them, but only followers of Jesus are taught to love their enemies. And he quotes again from Scripture, Luke 6, 27. Jesus said, Love your enemies and do good, do good to those who hate you. And lastly, point number three, we are praying for you. Because he reasoned, if a terrorist could taste, see and experience the love of God for just one time, it would drive every bit of hatred from his heart. And, it says, and as such, he again quotes from Scripture, Luke 6, 28. Blessed are those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You see, the church, the Coptic church in the Middle East has gone through waves, decades, centuries of persecution. Yet they remain strong and steadfast because they have held fast to the Word of God, remembering the words of the Apostle, where they guard, they keep the, the God's words so closely and so tightly that they not just fan off false teachers, but allow them to last, survive, and even thrive in times of hardship such as persecution. Church, how about you? Are you in a difficult spot today? Are you in times of crisis? Perhaps your health isn't doing too good. The doctor came to you with a report and said, I'm sorry, you have this illness. Or perhaps you have just lost your job, looking at your bills and just thinking, how on earth am I going to put food on the table? Or perhaps your relationship is at the bottom. Your marriage is fading out. In times of crisis, in times of difficulty, will you hold on? Will you guard? Will you keep the Word of God close into your life to the point that you can fend off not just false teachers, but allow you to gain strength, understanding who you are in Christ and Christ in you to the point that you last, survive, and even thrive through difficult times. Church, today we have covered what it means to be unashamed of Jesus Christ, His gospel, of which may we unashamedly profess it because we have tasted His goodness 
May we internalize the gospel so that we can live holy life, conform, renew, and transform to be like Him. Truly irresistible and attractive. Easy from this position to live unashamedly for Jesus. May we pass the test to be unashamed of our Lord Jesus because the proof and test of us being unashamed is to be unashamedly loving and caring for the least of His people. May we also be unashamed of His word, keeping, guarding to the point that it will not just fan our false teachers but allow us to last, survive, and even thrive through difficult times.